Hello everyone. Today we'll be starting on a new topic called graphing motion. In this topic we'll be learning about how to write down motion on paper. So we'll be learning about graphing things like displacement, and velocity, and then reading those graphs to find out more information about the motion of the object. So to start, we'll be learning about displacement time graphs. In this slideshow we'll be learning about how to write down displacement on paper with graphs and how to read the graphs to learn about the displacement of the object as well as the velocity of the object. Now when we're graphing physical quantities over time, time is always the independent variable. It's the variable that we can't change and so it's not ever dependent on anything. So we put it on the x-axis as normal. As we know in science we always put the independent variable on the x-axis, whatever that may be. We measure time in seconds which of course is how we measure time on clocks and stopwatches and so on. I'm sure you know what they are. Now, when we uh, graph an object's position over time, it's called a displacement time graph. So we can see one here. Uh, the object's position is measured in meters on the y-axis of the graph, which we can see over here. Of course, because it's displacement, it's also important to include the direction if it's not immediately obvious. Uh, of course, on the x-axis, we have time because that's the independent variable, as I said before. Now, position is measured relative to a coordinate system. So, whenever we're graphing displacement, we have to know where zero is at the bottom of the graph. Otherwise, it won't really make sense. So, here we have an animation of a train's position being graphed over time. We can see that at the very start of the graph, the train is right at the bottom of the tracks. It moves up. And at this point, it stops moving. And so at this point, the graph is flat, and the train's position doesn't change over time. Then it moves backwards, and we can see that the graph moves back downward as the train moves back along the track. Now, a displacement time graph usually graphs an object's position along a single axis. Because obviously one axis is time, the other axis has to be position. And the axis can represent either north to south in some graphs, or right to left, so above the graph will be to the right and below the graph will be to the left, forwards or backwards, same sort of deal, or up and down, which would make most sense uh, in this configuration because obviously um, if it's above the line, it's up, and if it's below, it's down. Now displacement uh, over a graph may be negative, meaning that if it's less than zero, it simply means the object is below the starting point, or to the left of the starting point, or to the south of the starting point, or so on. Now, when an object is moving fast, its displacement graph gets steeper. So we can see in this graph over here that the object starts off at zero and moves very, very quickly toward a displacement of 10 meters. And so in just five seconds, it gets all the way there. And, in fact, the velocity of the object can be found by measuring the slope of the graph, uh, which, of course, as you know, is rise over run. And so if we take the rise of the object here, 10 meters, we divide it by the run, 5 seconds, we get its velocity. And 10 divided by 5 means it's 2 meters per second. Now, a positive slope means that the object is moving to the right, or up, or north, or whatever the positive displacement represents. And, of course, a negative slope would mean the object is moving to the left. So in this graph over here, we have an object that's moving away from us to the right. Uh, it reaches uh, a displacement of 10 meters and then stops. And then it moves back to the left, or to the south, or down, or so on. Now, the velocity of an object is rarely constant in the real world. So you'll never get straight lines in the real world. There'll always be curves. There'll never be any angles. Of course, in, uh, in theory, in our theoretical physics, we can always put straight lines everywhere just to make things simpler. But in the real world, that's never the case. So the slope of a displacement time graph will often be curved, as we can see here. The instantaneous velocity of an object, that is the exact velocity at any one instance, can be found by finding the slope of the tangent. So we can see a tangent here is drawn next to the curve. And the slope of this tangent is the speed or velocity of the object at that very point in time, at exactly two seconds. 
Now as well as finding the instantaneous velocity, we can find the average velocity of an object. And to find the average velocity with a graph, we draw a chord between the object's start point and its end point. So the slope of this chord is the average velocity of the object over all that time. And if an object is always moving, its average velocity can be zero. Uh, that means that if the object were to move up and then it were to move down again, drawing a chord from the start to the end would simply result in a flat line, meaning its average velocity is zero. Here, of course, that's not the case. The object moves a total of about 10 meters over five seconds, so its average velocity is 10 divided by two is five meters per second. Whereas the instantaneous velocity here is a lot flatter. So its instantaneous velocity here is slow, and its instantaneous velocity here is fast. But its average velocity over time is the slope of this chord. Let's take a look at a bit of an example. Uh, here we have a displacement time graph of a car stopping briefly at a set of traffic lights. So as we can see, the car is moving forward up to about five seconds when it realizes the light is red, and it stops. After 10 seconds, the light goes green again, and the car accelerates and drives off into the distance. So we can see that it started with an instantaneous velocity of 10 meters per second forward, because if we were to draw a tangent right at the very start, uh, it would meet at this point here. If we take a look at this slope, it's 50 divided by 5, which is 10. So its instantaneous velocity is, of course, 10 meters per second. What about its average velocity? Well, its average velocity over 15 seconds can be found by joining the very start of the graph to the very end of the graph. We end up at this point here, 100 meters displaced after 15 seconds. Dividing 100 by 15, uh, we can get its speed, uh, its, sorry, its average velocity over these 15 seconds. And 100 divided by 15 turns out to be 6.67 meters per second. So this is its average velocity. Of course, because it's a vector, in both cases we need to include its direction as well. So we can say 10 meters per second forward, otherwise it'd just be the speed. This concludes the theory. Uh, today we've learned about displacement time graphs and how to analyze them to find the displacement and the velocity of an object. Let's go on to some questions. Question 1. In a certain displacement time graph, a point above the x-axis is due east of a starting point. What must be true about a point below the x-axis? Well. Let's draw the graph and find out. So here's a displacement time graph. There's our displacement. We'll represent it with an x. There's time. Now, the object that's above the x-axis is east of the starting point. So that means that this axis must be graphing east and west rather than north and south. So right away, we can see that this doesn't mean that it's north of its starting point if it's below the x-axis, nor does it mean that it's south of the starting point. We can't gain any of that information from this graph because it'll only tell us the east and west. So it has to be C or D. Now if it were east of the starting point, it would be above the x-axis. We already know this, so this can't be our right answer. Finally, we have west of the starting point, and we find that if, indeed, it is below the x-axis, it's on the opposite side of the displacement. So a point below must be west of the starting point. And indeed, we see that D is the right answer. Of course, not all displacement graphs have east and west. Some, of course, have left and right, or up and down, forward and back, or any other dimension that you can think of. Question two. At the marked point here, what can we deduce about this car that's being graphed by the displacement time graph? Let's take a look at our options. A, it is moving southward. Now the sign of the tangent slope is what tells us whether it's moving northward or southward. If it were moving northward, it would have a positive slope. If it's moving south, it has a negative slope. We can see that at this point, the tangent is still positive, which means that the car is still moving northward, and option A is wrong. What about B? It is speeding up. Now we can see that over here, the car's velocity is quite fast, but near the end it's a lot slower. 
so it can't be speeding up. It is in fact slowing down, so B can't be the right answer either. What about option D? It is moving very quickly. Now remember, the velocity of an object depends on the slope of the line. If it's very steep, like this, then it's moving very quickly. If, on the other hand, it's close to zero, like this, then it's actually moving quite slowly. So D is incorrect. Finally, let's look at option C. It is north of its starting position. Remember, we can tell the position of the object simply by looking at whether it's above or below the uh, x-axis. So we can see that in this case, it is above the x-axis, which means north. And so we see that C is the correct answer. It is north of its starting position. Question three. Draw a qualitative graph of an apple's altitude after it has been tossed up into the air. Now remember, when we throw something into the air, it can start off moving quite fast, but as gravity pulls down on it, it'll eventually sort of slow down in the air, then stop, then turn around and fall back down, eventually reaching the same speed that it started with. And so, to draw this on a graph would look something like this. On the x-axis, we of course have time, because that's always the independent variable. On the y-axis, we have its displacement, or in this case, altitude, because we're graphing the up and down position. We can see that at the start, it's moving quite fast. At the peak of its toss, it uh, levels out and starts moving the other direction. And by the time it reaches the bottom, its negative slope is the same as the positive slope that it started off with. So your graph should look something like this. Question four. Draw a graph of an arrow's path as an archer draws, aims, and fires the arrow at a target 20 meters away. Well, obviously on the x-axis we'll have to have time, and on the y-axis we'll have displacement. Because we need direction, it'll be displacement towards the target. So our graph starts off looking something like this, with time on the x-axis and displacement on the y-axis. Now, when the archer draws his arrow back, his arrow will be moving away from the target. So we can start off by drawing a little line, like this, with the arrow moving backwards, just a little. Now as soon as the archer releases the arrow, it's going to fly forward toward the target very, very fast indeed. So it'll be an almost vertical line, it looks something like this. So you can see the arrow has been released and it's flying up toward the target. But as soon as it reaches the 20 meter mark, it hits the target. And so it stops completely. And that of course is represented by a horizontal line as we can see here. So the graph should look something like this. Question five, what motion does this graph describe? Well, we can see that the x-axis is time and the y-axis is displacement, so it's a displacement time graph, which is good, it's what we're used to. Uh, it looks like it's going back and forth very quickly and then sort of shooting off in a straight line at the end. And in fact, when we think about it, if something's going back, forth, back, forth, or forward, back, forward, back, or up, down, up, down, it's as if the object is moving in a circle, but we're only seeing one component of motion. So if an object's moving in a circle in that sort of dimension, then we can see that my hand's moving left and right as I move it around in a circle. And if we were to look at the forward and back, we would once again see my hand's moving forward and back as it's moving in the circle. And so this pattern is in fact consistent with an object that's moving in a circle. Except for this last part, the straight line sort of flying from the direction. That must mean that it stops moving in a circle and it starts moving in a straight line. So we see that the motion that this graph is describing is an object that's being swung in circles and then let go. Finally, question six. What motion does this graph describe? Well, it looks like we have two objects here. We have one blue object who's moving like this and one yellow object is moving in the other direction. We can see that the blue object's slope is negative and the yellow object's slope is positive. So they're moving in opposite directions. One has a, the yellow one has a positive velocity and the blue one has a negative velocity. As well as this, we can see that the blue one is a little bit steeper than the yellow one. So it must be moving faster. So we can see that the two objects are moving in opposite directions, one moving faster than the other. But then we have this little point here. And here something interesting happens. Both of the objects sort of have the same position because they're at the same y-coordinate and they both turn into a slope of zero. And that means that they stop moving because their velocity must be zero. And so 
uh, what we can figure out from this is that the two objects must have collided with each other because uh, when they meet the same uh, y-axis, uh, when they meet the same y-coordinate, they're in the same position, so they must be touching each other. And it also means that their uh, velocity turns into zero, so they must have both stopped. So we can deduce that they must have smashed into each other. Perhaps two cars on a highway head in the opposite direction. This is the end of the question. Uh, we have learned today about displacement time graphs and how to deduce both displacement and velocity by examining the y-coordinate and the slope of a displacement time graph.